Yep. All right. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, Sherry. I was hoping to see Paula today. Um, you know, she's several hundred miles inland, but her house was in the direct line of uh, the, the latest hurricane that hit the East Coast there. But um, I'll, I'll just tell you what, she's not here, but I'll, I'll tell you, um, I spoke to her, there was only a few shingles lost in this thing, right? People died, there was severe flooding, houses were wiped off their slabs in some cases, and hers is still standing. And I think it is an amazing testimony. So I, was, I hope she slips in today um, to talk to her about that. She may be um, in the midst of the, the what, what, you know, the cleanup phase of, of this uh, disaster, but I'm thankful that Father spared her and gave her a testimony. All right. I mean, so, um, any of you guys working on, on codes? Scott, you, you, you got anything? Um, yeah, brother, I've, I've got a handful of things. Actually, if you guys got time. Oh, we got time, and I'm kind of Everybody heard nobody, seen Chris. Um, I hadn't seen him in a while. It's kind of I don't know if he's gardening. I was in or touch what's with going on, but, yeah. Oh, he's he's real busy with his outdoor chores. Like I, I was in touch with him about a week ago, and he briefly we briefly messaged each other back and forth, and he reassures us that he loves us and, and he wants to be here. He's just got a lot going on. Probably because uh, they got winter coming in uh, in Ottawa. He's he's further north, so uh, he's probably getting everything ready for winter. I would imagine um, is what's going on. But just to know that, that that's what it is is uh, relief because we, you know, sometimes if we if we're alone, any of us, we can come under some kind of attack and nobody will know about it. Um, sure, not in contact with somebody. So, all right, that's good. But, um, uh, let's see, where do we begin? Um, I guess I'll start sharing my screen. Um, first of all, um, brother Jake did his very first presentation for NIC TV not too long ago it was regarding the greater exodus. Um, but he recounted a story back in, uh, January when he, and he had seen uh, the conjunction that occurred with Mars and Jupiter and the scales. I don't know if you remember that it happened, but way back in January, and it, it appeared as a really bright star in the sky. Yeah. And he didn't know what was going on at the time. And he, it was in his view as he was driving home the whole night. And he had pointed his uh, Stellarium map up at it to see where it was. And he saw what it was and the spirit uh, had told him to open up his Bible and he opened it up to uh, Daniel 525 um, uh, the Mene Mene uh, Tekel of Harsin verse yep. uh, 25 through 27 and uh, I was talking to him about it I thought it was kind of interesting because I've heard him tell the story before um, so uh I was just curious to see if what the codes had to say about it. So, um, uh, and this is my first attempt at annotating. So I just kind of had some fun with it. And um, <clears> the <throat> access term is right here. Now I've noticed that um, they use this abbreviation. My computer wants to act slow again here. I don't know. Can you guys see it? Yes. Yep. Okay. So, um, USA, oh, by the year, the year. Okay. I use the year as the axis right here. And here you'll have USA in the purple, uh, sharing uh, twice in the same line sharing the hay right right here and from what i understand this is the abbreviation that they're using for usa aleph resh hay bet yeah that's one okay yeah it's one of them it's one of them and, it, and this is how it shows up in the translator so i went with it and um this whole row of text right here starting way over here 
And going way over here up into the axis is Daniel 5, 25 through 27. And um, this is where the details are right here. Um, you have Mars here and Jupiter in the orange. Um, you have USA again right here in the purple. And then you have this word for the scales, mem, shin, kuf, lamed. It also means weight or balance. And it intersects right here where it, where it says you have been found want, you've been weighed and you've been found wanting. So I thought that was pretty cool. And then you have the date right here in pink. Um, the 20th to vet is when it happened. Calf, tet, bet, tau. And uh, it shares the calf in uh, the yellow word here, the stars. Kukubim, kukubim, right? Right. Uh, yeah, it's big. Uh, there's the calves of feed, wav, calf, bet, yod, mem. So uh, there's there's more details in here, and it was the first term that I think there was a couple of them that came up um, for this, and Dan and I specifically looked in Daniel for this. Um, so I thought that was kind of fun to do, but. Uh, the meat of uh, tonight's presentation is uh, uh, D Dr. Glazeson uh, uploaded a uh, table yesterday. On Sukkot? And I want to... The one on Sukkot? Huh? Which one? On The one on Sukkot? It is. Sukkot. No, Shiloh, no, yes. Ah, uh, yeah. I saw that one too. That is really good that you did that. That's cool. Um, here's the thing. He played it off like this here was his axis mm -hmm. but i could i could tell right away now he doesn't say it's the axis he says it's the center now when you look on the page yeah it is in the center of the page but it's, it's not the center term I, I i could tell right away by looking at over here sukkot 5779 was his axis and what he did was he he put a skip in it and changed the page width it took me five five minutes to figure it out. Yeah, he's, um, yeah. he's got one uh, one verse going through, one skip in the letter. Yes, for Sukkot yes. five seven seven nine. Right. Um, what he did was he used this as an axis. He split it in half. Um, I think originally it was at like twenty six thousand two hundred fifty five. Um, he split it in half and then changed the page width and put two more characters to make this line up because at 13127, the center term here was off a little bit. So he just upped it by two characters and, it, and made it line up. So it's perfectly good methodology, which is perfectly fine. That's good. That's perfectly fine methodology. But, I mean, don't play it off like it's your axis. Because if you put this in as an axis, I don't, I'm not so sure that it would come up the same way. It, it may come up in a different field of text. Um, and then he went on to say the name of Messiah. I don't, I don't know if he was trying to liken Moshe to the Messiah. Well, you know, we, you know, M M Moses is is a Messiah. He was, he was, and there have been many. There's not just one Messiah or Mashiach. That word is very broad, sort of like Elohim. It, it, right. it means anointed one. It means one that, that has been ch chosen for a purpose and has a mission. Uh, so that, that applied to Moses. That also applied it to um, Joseph. Jo it, was, it was a purpose that Joseph was sold by his brothers into slavery and found himself in Egypt because he had purpose. He was a Mashiach, Zephanapaneah in uh, the Egyptian meant savior of the world. Um, and that's, that's what happened when he came there and uh, became the, the keeper of the grains and the, the accountant um, in this status. But uh, Mashiach is very broad. Moses is definitely one of them. But the Mashiach, the son of the Most High, there is only one of those. Right. And that's what I was stirred up and led to do because – you know, I heard the Spirit telling me, well, I've said who I am in the Torah, and go go look. Incidentally, 
the, the name Moshe, um, because you have the name of the Messiah, it doesn't necessarily have to be that Moshe's there. Because if you read Moshe in reverse, it's the name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you got the uh, name name of the Messiah. Um, yes, yes. Uh, and then he was saying over here that Shiloh relates to this as well. I guess Shiloh is where they they congregated before the first temple was built and uh, where they set up the tent of the meeting. So he was relating all that to that. And it, it's, I just done this a couple of times with some of his stuff. I know a couple of, of you other uh, students have as well. It's just, you know, good practice to do stuff like this. Um, but I, the table that I did in kind of response <laughs> to this, let's see, let's let the Torah, let's let him say who he is, right? Yes. So I was led, uh, was led to this. <laughs> wow. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'm just going to zoom in on it, brother, and I'm going to let you look at it. That's uh, sweet. <laughs> that is so cool. The axis starts here at the Aleph and goes up. Aleph, Nun, Yod, He, Mem, Shin, Yod, Het. I am the Messiah. And you have Yeshua right on top of it. Sharing, sharing, landing on the Shin in Mashiach at a seven-letter skip. Going right down. And then running right through it, you have Ben... <laughs> yes, cool. Yeah. Isn't that cool? Sharing the yod, yes. But see, this is actually a split off with another word. This this ku fresh before it. And makes, so you got a abacus effect, which goes there with that code, by the way. It's it's not an accident, but it's an abacus. Right. Yeah. That's and incredible. yes, yes. Uh, I was blown away. He was telling me to go look, and, and this is came up right away. <laughs> Um, the, the, I bookended this, uh, these verses here, uh, with this black line running through and that's in Leviticus 23, uh, Sukkot, um, let's just read the verses real quick. Uh, hallelujah. Sukkot. Hallelujah. Um, <laughs> this is a time of peace, by the way. I saw that in, in another, uh, part of he comes in a time of peace, and he does. Yes, this is after, interesting because after the judgment, he comes to Israel and brings them peace. Yes. Um, let's see. It starts here at verse forty-two, uh, or actually, it starts in verse twenty for uh, it's forty-one. It starts in forty-one, and you shall keep it a, a feast unto Yahuwah seven days in the year. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. You shall, shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths in seven days. All that are Israelites born shall dwell in booths. And this is really interesting because where it says here is you shall dwell in booths. You'll see the word teshuva encoded, teshub. You shall dwell in booths. That's cool. I thought that was pretty neat. And then right above that, you have a bula in the green, yod, bet, Wav, Aleph, uh, and it shares the Aleph in I, 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 am, I am Yahuwah, I am Yahuwah, going this way. Um, and uh, what you were talking about, entering in a time of peace, um, over here, um, I found uh, Son of Jesse, Ben Yishai, and then I found an extension now, this is really interesting, this extension word up here. Bet, shin, lamed, mem. In peace. That could mean, that could take on several different meanings. Um, yeah, it, it means in, a, in peace time, in the time of peace, if you start it with the bet. Or it can mean in Salem, which is what Jerusalem was called previously before Jerusalem. Or... Uh, Bet Shin Lamed means uh, ripe. Like when the harvest is ripe, this word appears only once in the Tanakh, and it's in Joel, uh, Joel when it says, uh, 
when it talks about the angel thrusting his sickle in the earth because the time of the harvest is ripe. Um, so it can take a kind of it can kind of take a spin either way, but either way, it's all relevant. Yeah. And then of course, and then of course, over here you have the year. Now I'm not saying this is all happening this year, but I just since he had put the date in his table, I'll, I put the date and let's see what he's saying in five seven seven nine. So, so I say to you. Uh, kindly, Dr. Glazes and Yeshua Hamashiach, who a Hamalek Melakim, who a Meleki, he is my king, Yeshua. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Very good Very looking nice table, brother. And it is technically a Torah code. Yes. That's That's really cool. I may uh, look for that myself and see what else is there. That's a really good um, Yeshua table. That's, a, that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about that gives you chills up your spine when you find something yes. like that. And when you find it vertically with the name encoded in it is, um, man, that's like lightning striking the same place a thousand times. It just doesn't happen. Right. I had a seven letter skip too. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. That's, Hallelujah. Very nice, brother. Thank you, guys. It's all him. Hey, like I said, you know, sometimes I'll mow through for hours, and then when I feel the spirit move, it's like there could be a list of 50 access terms, and it's like the very first one. I don't have to look any further. It's like right there, you know, and that's all just being led by the spirit, you know. I, I haven't been doing this half as long as some of you guys. And I don't, I'm just a guy sitting at a laptop punching in codes, you know, I'm just being led by the spirit. That's how he does it, brother. And learning the language, you know, it's how he does it with all of us, really. I mean. Well, um, I've got several in front of me, but they're, they're, they're slow work in progress. Let me show you here. Like this is um, since the last video I did or before that, um, I was talking about the fullness of the Gentiles. So I just went and, and pulled it up. I've worked it before, but I wanted to rework it um, since it was you know, fresh on my mind from this teaching. But that's all I have right here so far is just the access term. Um, and then let's see. I'm going to have to stop here. It's not going to let me transition. Got another one around the same. Um, around the same time I found this one. I'm going to think what it was. Um, hmm. Oh, I know what it is. This is Rothschilds. For some reason, I started uh, thinking about the Rothschilds. It's, oh, I know what it was. <clears throat> I was watching a documentary, and um, one of the first Rothschilds made a comment back, I think, in the 1600s or something like that, that he who controlled the money system controlled the government. And he went for, and further to say, and I control all the money. So... Um, even that far back, the Rothschilds were into monopolizing the banking system. And uh, so that kind of, I thought about that and just like, wow, let's go see what's up with the Rothschilds. Because I've looked for Bilderbergs before and things and, you know, the Bohemian Grove and, you know, so all, of the, yeah, all of the elites and stuff. So I do have the access term and it does appear several times. I mean, Rothschilds are, are there a lot. I mean, it gets up to extreme um, access width, but on the other end of the spectrum, even a very small width, 364. Um, I chose 8874 just to kind of look at it, and that is as far as I got on the Rothschilds. Um, 
and, and this kind of demonstrates how random sometimes these access terms can be. And what I got in front of me is uh, five of them. Um, that first one is um, the false rapture. So I was talking about that not too long. So I'm still looking at stuff in that. Then the next one was, uh, I think, the time of distress. Nope. This is Jacob's distress or Jacob's trouble. And then uh, Mila Hagoyim, the fullness of the Gentiles. And then uh, I had the raw child. And then this one <clears throat> is the distress of the Gentiles. Uh, so this is the distress of the nations. I think that there's a connection between this and Jacob's trouble. They're interconnected. These marks here are just me going through verses and kind of um, going down the line and kind of marking the beginning of, of verses. So it's a little method I use to kind of keep uh, a mental um, map of where I am in the, in the sequence of going through these verses and stuff. Um, so you, you may develop these kind of things yourself where, where you know, like I just went from top to bottom and just read what's in the field and uh, note where it is in rel in relevance to the access term and just keep going. Um, and then I come back and review and then I may start looking for ELS terms. Um, I've even highlighted verses before that I've, before I've even done any ELS searches and then do the yellow searches. And a lot of times you'll see um, the, the actual verses that you thought was significant will have a multi-hit um, anomaly with some terms. Like you have a term that, that a letter will be in one verse and another letter be in another verse and in another verse. And uh, when that happens, that's kind of, that's kind of cool because you chose, you said to yourself, these seem significant to this table. And then in the process later down the line, when you chose that access term and they kind of slam right into those um, verses, then it's like another witness say, okay, so I'm, I'm right on target here. And so there's, there's a couple of methods that I do. And that's where I am on this. So I'm still working my way down um, the verses that are in the, in the text. And I'll look on either side of it too. This is called snooping, by the way. Somebody else coin that phrase, but it's just basically looking in the different fields on the right and the left periphery above and below. Um, it's all that is. It's just looking in the different fields of what is going over, going on in the text um, around the access term itself. And of course, this is not the only thing that's encoded like this. There are thousands of other access terms that are potentially in this field as well. Um, some have no relation to what you're looking for. Some have a direct relation to what you're looking at. Um, but it's a blank slate until it's worked, obviously. And that's it. That's the five I've got in front of me. And uh, so I imagine this is probably why there's a slow process and, and you know, to, to get to a you know, presentable table. Uh, it takes a lot of time. And so when I'm spread that out over five, that sometimes can take a while before any of them are ready. But, um, again, that's just how my brain works. That sometimes I have to bounce back and forth, or I'll I'll lose interest in one, or I'll I'll stall in one. Where as far as the the access, I mean the the ELS terms are just not there anymore. I'm just thinking, where am I going with this? What's what else am I supposed to see here? Right. So I'll put it down for a while, and move on to something else. And. Uh, That's what I'll do. All right, so where are we at, guys, in your modules for those that are not working on codes? How are, how are you doing? Everything okay? Yep, still working on modules. You stuck anywhere? You got any questions? Uh, not really. I'm slowly going through it. I'm trying to uh, get it all down word by word. And I really like them hallelujah scripture verses. Good. Good. Uh, I have been really slow. I'm on... I think I'm on 20, no, or 22, no, I, uh, but uh, I, 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 
probably I'm going to finish tonight this module. So I'm going to try to move faster. If you need to take your time, don't, don't pressure yourself because I want you to be able to absorb whatever's there. Um, yeah, and then sometimes there's a lot of, lot of things going on, so I just, uh, but I, I, I will try to do it faster. I've been really slow, so I have to uh, accelerate the pace. Right. How's, how's life going, Terrence? Uh, I know you're... you're doing some consulting and stuff. So yeah, I'm, just, I'm just coming out of the end of that now, and um, I'm down with a bug at the moment, but um, I'm still on uh, module 10, I think. Yeah, around lesson 35, going to have to redo it and revise it. And I'll probably, um, I'll probably do that next week. Pretty good. Gerald, how are you doing? Well, the um, Scott, what was the verse in Leviticus that, um, with that code um, up in the top right-hand corner, the same oh, that uh, th these are the these uh, for your gen and for all your generations. That's uh, in, Le in Leviticus twenty-three forty. Oh, let's see. That's Leviticus twenty-three forty-one and forty-two. Thanks. That'll be starting in the top of that. It will be where it lists all of them. And um, <clears throat> what I see in this is that it's uh, it's obviously repetition involved. I mean, you're, you're observing these things over and over and over and over a year after, you know, many years of it. People were probably yeah. in ancient times thinking, why are we doing this? You know, <laughs> but it's practice. It's, uh, it's for learning. Uh, and and remembering because if you see what happens to Ephraim and the scriptures, they have a problem remembering who they are and they forget. And so that's what happens um, throughout the generations. If, if you don't have these these traditions and and they're passed down, then there tends to forget or adopt other and you know, lose completely the culture <clears throat> in itself. So some have called it uh, wedding rehearsals trumpets but you know for the most part it's a bonding experience with your family um especially Sukkot is seven days of camping out under the stars and um you're cooking out on the grill every day and uh, that's kind of fun when you're doing it with all your your kids and your family and there's no devices and no um uh, you know running off to do whatever it's all about you that's pretty cool and um that's the season we're in right now. It's also the season I got married to Darla. So uh, it's kind of twice as special. We'll be doing it right out here and probably sharing it with everybody um, as much as we can, a lot of streaming, <clears throat> that kind of thing. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not across all that stuff. I don't even know what some of those words mean. Yeah, uh, I get it. So I was looking at the Moadeen thing of last week. <clears throat> which is to do a, a word I'd never heard before. Um, so I gather that that is talking about a, a series of feasts it was the impression I got. Um, I don't understand any of that stuff. Um, so I'm just trying to take a bit of a, uh, you know, a side interest in it. Uh, I think we're going to try to do a little more um, teaching on those. Like, for instance, uh, you know, I don't like um, – opening cans of worms sometimes, especially when it's, you know, the arguments are sometimes very trivial, you know, flat earth, round earth, those kind of things. You know, does the most I really want us arguing over those kind of things or, or, or maybe a more noble argument would be, do we use his name? I would think that would be a better argument. But, uh, you know, so in these feasts, like I said, it's just not just about the Jews. And it's, that's what some Christians will throw at you. That's the, for the Jews. It's about getting to know the Father because these are these are His, and there's a plan in there that we're supposed to figure out. Um, but there's there's still there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of cross teachings where uh, there's some things that are they, they've left in the rabbinical parts of it, and so there's confusion. Are we supposed to do this or we're not? But it's all going to be reconciled in the end. Um, 
it's part of uh, you know coming back to him i believe yeah but you know somebody asked me about the calendar do you have a calendar will you teach that um and, and you know i didn't want to open the can of worms because it will absolutely put a target on us for that because some people think it's heretical even to, to observe the lunar calendar at all um, but somebody did ask me will you teach us that calendar and how and how that works and i thought the only way to do that is is to mark out starting with a b and and you know go through the year documenting the year in that count to demonstrate it does come out right because the, the argument that most the, that oppose it is the extra or the days that seem to be um pushing everything off and that's because of the whole days are not observed the the uh, new moon days and so what it does is it pushes those other full moons and things like that when they're supposed to fall on a shabbat it pushes it further and so on the gregarian calendar it will not reconcile when you look at it that way um but ha having doing it f for the past three to four years i think it's four years now we've been on exclusively on a lunar calendar all of the festivals all of these shabbats fall on the appropriate day in conjunction with the moons and um the seasons this is something i've, I've I noticed sometimes the seasons are longer or the seasons are shorter you'll have winter come early or winter come later we all seen that in some way same things plays out in the stars today happens to be the first day of autumn on on the equinox but we've already come through a feast that usually you know is in conjunction with that right scotty pointed it out i was baffled for about 24 hours of what was going on and then who you know clarified my thought patterns and said you're not starting in the seventh month <laughs> with your count you've already counted six moons you just counted your seventh moon why would you listen to scotty and count one more moon which would be the eighth and then start your tura <laughs> so i thought you know we have we've caught we've counted six moons already we are in the right moon I can't explain why it's not in the right place in the Maserat, but the Most High knows. But then he, 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 he revealed to me, sometimes seasons are shorter and seasons are longer because of the elliptical movement of the moon. The moon is elliptical. It's not perfectly round where everything is going to hit. That's why you have to side it every month because it's unknown. You don't know if it's going to be earlier or later, right? The same thing will happen in the Maserat in some seasons. You know, here it is. We're, we're getting ready to celebrate Sukkot. And today is the first day of autumn. But it's only like a week and a half difference from any other point of the year. So in, you know, in um, perspective with the degrees of the sky in which it was, it was only a couple of degrees off. It, it's it's not a big thing. It's actually a, a oscillation of the moon, and you know, it appeared to me that we were in some kind of something was up. I couldn't. I was just waking up, having my coffee, and watched Scotty's video, and was like, my brain was scrambled. I was like, what is going on? Why is the Maserat not right? Right? And I was I was thinking about it completely wrong, and that's the, that's the problem with a lot of the ones who are, are thinking it's a it's a problem right now. They're looking at it wrong. If you start with a B and count those months through the moons, it falls on the right day. What those same people are going to find when we get back to Passover, they're going to be observing B, uh, a B at a different time than us a month later. And what they're going to find is if they had waited or they wait that long to declare the, that the, the barley is a B, it's too late. You're already into the harvest time now. It's impossible to declare it a beeb. It was done a month before, and this is why. And this is why the Jews will add a Adar bet or another month to the year to offset that. So uh, if we wait until Passover time, we'll, we'll see this happen. Um, these same ones who are talking about, you know, Sukkot is actually a month from now, will be trying to figure out what's going on with the beeb. <laughs> So their whole year is thrown off because they tried to observe it 
starting at the seventh month and nothing's reconciled. Nothing reconciles to the, to the rest of the month. So we're going to start it to be in Passover and document that count, including the count, the, the um, counting of the Omar and all the way through, which is ex tracing the Exodus actually from Passover time all the way out into the desert to Sukkot to what happened at Sinai. Um, they document this with feasts. They're, they're, they're present in the Old Testament. And the days are known. Um, it tells us how many, how many weeks in, how many moons, all that kind of stuff is there. However, in the English translation, there can be some confusion on how to, to interpret that count when you're you know, trying to interpret Hebrew text in the Old English tongue. It can be, you know, what is tomorrow after the Sabbath? The Sabbath, uh, you know, the morrow after seven morrows after the Shabbats and stuff like that. So there's confusion in that count with the Omer. And a lot of times, what will happen for those Christians that are trying to keep it is they'll they'll find themselves when they get to the next set of feasts, it's off, and that's what's happened. They're at least thirty days off in, in this one, and using the the, the fact that this the Maseroth is off it to say that those counting from uh, Aviv is wrong. And it's not going to reconcile. I can tell you now when they come back to Passover, it's not going to be the right time for them. And, uh, so I think that that's when we'll start doing the teaching on the way to observe the calendar is at that time. I'll point all that out again, how, um, it's, it's about the grain harvest and, uh, those those cycles that it's tied to the first crescent moon closest to that Aviv is going to be your first month. But just so I'm correct, brother Jonathan, today's day four, right? Since Monday is Shabbat. Um, I think so. I don't have Darla here, so um, sometimes I don't even know what day of the week it is. Like, you know, <laughs> you're on your boat. I'm not even kidding. I'll have to go and look for it somewhere because I'm doing another count. <clears throat> and I think you're right. Um, tomorrow is not the only one. Saturday, I got to pick up my oldest son from the airport. And then um, we're going to start our, our um, Sukkot. Anyway. Awesome. Thank you. How you doing, Inga? Are you able to talk or you got, you got kids with you? No, I, I'm fine right now. <laughs> we have the house full of people, but I'm in my room, so I'm okay. Is anybody and I, I'm on lesson 11, and I have had a long pause because I've been super busy with the day home and the garden and everything. Yeah. Uh, today, right. I was just out before the snow falls again. I went to get the rest of the onions and carrots and stuff out of the garden because it's snowing again. Yeah. See, Inga's up there where Chris is. And that's what I was just saying earlier in, in a um, class. Nobody's seen Chris. And uh, somebody said that he's, uh, he's been working in the garden. And, and it occurred to me, you guys are getting snow now. Um, well, not Chris. Where he is, they've had a lot of heat. We have the opposite. We have cold. They have the heat. Over, uh, and over in Ottawa, Chris really? is also busy with his mom because she is ill. So they're having a later summer. Their summer's going into going yep. later. And are you getting an early winter? Is this early? Yes, yes, very early. Wow. Uh, I've seen freak snowstorms every month of the year, but they usually go next day or a couple of days later, and then you have nice weather again. This one is sticking. We, we, I think we have winter now. Yeah, I've, I've, uh, I've, I've seen cases. Now, you're manipulating the weathers. Of, of, oh, yeah. Everything because is we are the wheat belt. Yeah. We are the wheat belt here. Alberta and Saskatchewan is the wheat growing region in Canada that makes the best wheat for bread. No. Now that wheat is no good. Well, America's got a problem too because everything's been flooded. Um, not the, not the hurricanes earlier in, in the year. Yeah. With the fires on the west coast, they were in the central and in the the breadbasket of our nation. Floods um, in the grain belt of Kansas and um, all of those Oklahoma. Uh, Jonathan, uh, I was watching. You know that. A video you posted from um, the Nazarene. What's his yeah. name? Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I posted that yeah, yesterday. Four, 
I went back to look at all of his uh, videos on the book of Revelation, and he has an interesting take on it. He does. With the four horses, he is linking to the four um, to, to Islam. Pa patriarchs for each, you know, for Israel, for Ephraim. Uh, he Israel does have and, the flags too. Those four colors yeah. that are given. Yeah. If you look at every one of the Muslim countries in the mm -hmm. Middle East, that's their four colors of their flag. Every one of them had those four colors, except Saudi Arabia has a, an all, a, a green and white. But for the most part, the rest of them will have those colors. Those are the radical, fundamentally, you know, they, don't, they look at the um, Hadith and not the other part of the Quran. The Hadith is the more violent uh, part of the Quran. That, that's what they hold to. There was, uh, you know, Muhammad was bipolar. So there was at one point where he was friends with everybody, even the Jews, and then there, and in later writings, enemies with everybody, hates the Jews, kill all the Jews. So it's kind of like a book that contradicts <laughs> itself. So they hold to you the know, latter now, which is... You, you know, all, Jonathan? Yes. Oh. No, sorry. Sorry, I didn't want to cut you off. Go ahead. Who is this? So, sorry. Good, brother. Uh, sorry. What were you going to say? Oh, oh, yeah. Um, I just want to say that, like, I, I got this idea suddenly that th there are many interpretations mm -hmm. on, on on various scriptures like that, like the four horsemen. Yeah. <clears throat> but what if, like? Well, some of them may be wrong, but you're absolutely right. Somebody, they are some that are wrong. But yeah. but but uh, but uh, the point was that I was thinking about maybe it's so deep that it has multiple meanings, mm -hmm. and and like people are arguing if this is right, if this is right, and this is wrong. Like one interpretation that's right, but maybe there are several that just fit into like uh, different categories You're absolutely right like you know the um the wound that, that is healed let's just take that for example because i just recently saw a, a very compelling uh argument that that was fulfilled in the catholic church and under the reign of napoleon for 1260 days um the, their power was taken because napoleon went and arrested the archbishop, sent his general in to um, basically take over the Vatican and um, took away the power of the Pope. And that that wound was healed like 1260 days later or something in that problem, maybe combining these two prophecies together, paraphrasing here. But the, the, the narrator of this was pointing out that this interpretation that theologians today will attribute to the Antichrist actually could have been interpreted to be fulfilled under Napoleon. And it, the facts and the dates are, are, they line up. And so when I'm looking at that, I'm thinking, you know, I believe it because there's nothing that says all of these end time uh, prophecies are going to happen in the last three years, in the last seven years of um, the end days. What I've, Found, guys is the end times because we can't you know 100 years for us as human beings is a long time but for the most high it's a vapor yeah. the days that are outlined in daniel as the, the days where knowledge didn't increase man's running to and fro could be the last 150 years technically starting with the industrial revolution with trains and and uh, automobiles and airplanes and stuff and all of that developed and then the explosion of of technology that we've seen up until today, that's the end times. So it's been, you know, we've been in the end times all of your life, right? Yeah. We're just in the last years of the end days. Oh, Amen. Yeah. Who was this that was making these movies on Revelations that Ingers mentioned? That was in your video? This is um, he, Nazarene Israel, and it's uh, no, Norman... Um, is Norman Poole? Must it, it might be, let me go check. Hold on. Um, uh, crap. Uh, 
doesn't say his name on there. I have to go to the video. So this would be Nazarene Israel, but uh, I can't think of his guys. His name's Norman, I think. It's Nazarene. Is it on YouTube? Yeah, he's on YouTube. And uh, hold on, I'm gonna give you a link to this. I'll give it to you in the chat here. Okay. Thank you. Um, he's kind of, you know, he's got a really long beard and stuff. So he, he goes out of his way to look Jewish, but he, he identifies with Ephraim. He's actually going through Aliyah and all that. And so he's, he's in Israel, but uh, in this okay. it's kind of funny because in that video that um, Inga was talking about, he talks about the places you do not want to be in the end days, like America, Europe, and in Israel. And he happens to be <laughs> Israel now. Um, anyway, Inga, what was you saying um, that he was, uh, what stood out to you that you were, you were pointing out? Well, he, the way that he uh, mentioned, like the white horse was supposed to be Ephraim. The red horse is uh, Edom, I think. Uh, the black horse is uh, the... Um, Orthodox Jewish, and then and and the Rothschilds with the money. So he said that they have the money, they run, and then they work with the Pope because they own the Pope, so they think they can control him. That's, he wants that may be why I started looking for Rothschilds was listening to his him, him talking about um, Rothschilds in this way. And um, so anyway, it's kind of funny how the the access terms come for me is I'll hear something. Um, I, I may be reading something or I'm going down the road and hear something on the radio and it just, that's how, that's how I got to the raw towns. And this is probably through Norman's. Uh, I, can I just interject like, um, the, the seven church ages and the, or the, the seven churches in, 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 um, Asia minor that they can also represent the end times. Chrissy. Oh, Sorry, my. That's what the ding was. It was Chrissy. Uh, I, I, I just want to, uh, if you uh, did, you yeah, you like the seven, seven churches or assemblies, they can represent the end times, and I I just want to, um, like this uh, mistaken, uh, uh, like writing, um, they say like the the the. Um, like uh, the Bible is, how, how do you say it in English? Unsearchable. It's not unsearchable. It's fathomless. You can search it all your life and all, always find more. So it's not unsearchable. It's fathomless. Very good. So right. Maybe they choose two um, wrong words. Well, sorry. No, I, I mean, I get your point. And in, in, you know, nobody's saying that uh, Norman is right in his interpretation, but it's very, it's very um, compelling thought that, that uh, he poses. Um, I do know this when the time when um, Bullinger wrote his commentary on Revelation, I, I don't think that Revelation was unsealed at, to, to him. He's got a very good theory and in, in interpretation of it, but I personally think. Bollinger's interpretation of revelations is, you know, fundamentally, fundamentally flawed in some ways. So you're right. Not everybody's interpretation that we see out there is right, but some things sound good and some things just fit perfect, right? There's a difference. What, what sounds good and what fits. Well, as yeah. far as I understand, uh, Harold, in the end time, those seven churches will all be present. Yeah. They represent basically seven characteristics that, that we can fall into. If you read what those characteristics of those church, that is going to be the outline of the, of, you know, the peoples in, in what you can be multiple ones. I think too, you don't know, just like a dish, uh, Laodicean or uh, Smyrna or something. Probably you could be a combination because, um, well, I just see it in some in some people. I say, well, yeah, I could see that, and I could see this. Um, but th what's what's probably true is that those that are represented in the you know 
early time with John <coughs> are probably going to be the same characteristics. We're not talking about I, the same church, the same assemblies, obviously, but the same characteristics in those people in the what's called the church. Let me let this go. I think we, uh, well, uh, I'll just say it when it goes back. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan. Yes. I think we, there's one thing, because it's called Philadelphia, we must like uh, push ourselves together in, in, in more love because uh, it's called the, the Church of Brotherly Love. And Philadelphia, Phila, Philo, Philo. Is, is, like, is like friendship love. Brotherly love, yeah. It's different. Well, yeah, love. yeah. It's it's like um, like uh, yeah it's it's brotherly love. It's different than agape, yeah. which is a is a is a uh, godly love. Where um, yeah yeah agape is stronger. Yeah, but you must let us. But uh, but also not deny his name. Exactly, and there's a you know, Yeshua came teaching the name, and one of his he commanded. He says, "I just want you guys to love one another." Stop killing yeah. each other. Stop dividing. Stop arguing over trivial things and just love one another. Be, be, you know, be a brother to somebody. Simple request. But do you see that into Philadelphia? Is they, the, the, the people of the brotherly love, and they, uh, they know something about the name. So we can pick what church we want to be in just by our actions. I think so. Uh, I don't. I don't know if it's a, it's a, a conscious thought. I think people just kind of that's what's in them. You know, uh, there there's some people that are drawn to the ear tickling nonsense of the Joel Joe Olsteins, um, and that will be a whole group, a whole section of people in one of those churches. And I'll let you decide on which one that is. But um, they clearly fit in one of those seven churches. You you know it, it 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 actually says in the matrimonium or apocrypha from Hallelujah Scriptures. I was reading it and it says like like attracts like. So if you like something, if you if you hate hate, hate your brothers and sisters, you you are attracting people who hate their brothers and sisters. Yeah. So you attract. It's biblical. Basically, yeah. it's like synergy. You stir something, and uh, you know everything comes together in that uh, vortex. That synergy. That's what happens. You're right. They they attract one another. It's That's a great happens. analogy. Well, we were all drawn here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's another kind of synergy. You know, and it's and it's outlined in Malachi that, that the father pays attention. You say there, there's a, there are those that are meaning. And they're having these really interesting discussions. Some of them are discussing, are talking about my name. They might not, they may not, hey, it doesn't say they got my name right. It just says they're talking about my name, which means we could be discussing, how do you pronounce his name? You know, just those conversations of getting it right, it's outlined in Malachi. That, that this is special to the Father. That he says, you know what? I'm going to make them my people. They're going to be my jewels in my diadem. That's a big deal. Hallelujah. Uh, the other ones out there that are saying, you sacred name are you and yada, yada, yada. Th they'll have to answer to that, you know, before the father. Have, how's that to be a, an accuser of mine saying, you sacred name are you? Just simply because I say, point out, you know, the scripture says to exalt his name. Um, call upon his name. All of this reference to his name. And by the way, what is his name? What were we told? You know, because uh, they they said God and Lord, but that's not His name. That's a title, right? So, um, when you start waking up and come and figure that stuff out, and then those in the church come against you, that's a big red flag that the enemy is not liking it. He don't like it because there's power in that name. There's power in His name. Um, but we have to be uh, patient with the people who don't get it because. You're right. Some of us took a while. <laughs> I remember wondering about the name and what was it. Yeah. I would read it and go like, well, what, what, what is it? Yeah. Now I know. 
he, he, he says in Malachi, you know, they were, they're discussing my name and that's enough. That's enough for him to say, that's my people right there. And it's just like a loving father to, to respond in such a way, you know, uh, you simply want to know the name of your father. And, and that's a deep thing for some people and some, they just blow it off. It's nothing. It's under that sacred namer kind of stuff. He knows my heart. I don't need that kind of stuff. We'll see on the day that matters. You you have that argument on the day that matters. We'll see what happens. I've been excommunicated communicated by friends and family for, you know, believing in the name of Yahuwah and, and getting into the Hebrew. And that's what got me into the Hebrew language, learning the Hebrew language. Is I prayed for months and months on end to find the real name. I, and I, I did. I asked him, give me the real name so I know that I am calling you by your real name, not some title. The ones who despise his name are also mentioned in, in the same text. And yep. he confronts those who despise his name. They say, what do you mean? What do you mean? And he says, you despise my name. And then they're like, oh, oh, now we got a problem. That is a direct line from Malachi. He says, you, you know what, guys, you despise my name. What do you mean? We, what do you mean we despise your name? What do we do? That's their response. What? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. We did. We just oh, didn't think it was a big deal. You know, your name, even though we had scriptures saying, oh, gosh, man, we really missed that one. <laughs> it's <laughs> clear to me. It's clear to me when he outlines in Malachi, there's going to be these two groups. There are going to be some. They're going to be talking about my name, even how trying to hash out. How do you even pronounce it, right? They fear him. But then there's some. Yeah. Sacred name for you. Despise his name. They despise his name. And it's clear. I get that a lot. Yeah. So, sacred namer. You're yeah. wrong. And it's with a lot of viral, uh, vericity and, and, you know, just vicious, you know, and it, that's the fruit that comes from that tree. And yep. you know that's not from the Father. Uh, because this is a spirit that hates the name of the Most High. It's the enemy. Not your brother. Not I've been your told brother. I was spreading heresy because I was doing his name and not not what, you know, not God. And right. I'm like, dude, God you is a title. Doing, you're doing what the scripture says. When the scripture says, call upon his name. Right. Right. And I told the guy, I said, do you not to exalt said, his name? I, said, I told him, I said, do you not know that God is related to Gad and Gad is actually a fortune of Roman deity, a Roman deity of fortune. You're sitting here saying God and you're calling upon a Roman deity of fortune. I said, I'm saying his actual name, Yahweh, you know, that's heresy. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> it's, it's but you good. know what it is? It, it is the North American attitude. It is. We know everything, and English is everything. No, it is not. Yeah. I am an immigrant. I know. Yeah, it is not. <laughs> Listen, English is not the, even though we all, you know, it, it, the, the earth seems to have chosen English as the base, uh, you know, universal language, but it is not. Um, it's, it's not even that old. It's not even the original English. English, the original English was different. It was called the old English. Uh, it was not exactly what it, we have today. And even in it has, English, yeah. we have all these different slings and dialects and stuff. It's, so it's not. Because it's easy to understand. Yeah. You got, bon you got phonics and stuff. It's a form of English. But, it, but, it's, but it's like Dutch. Dutch is a mix of different languages, too. You can hear it when they talk. It, mm -hmm. I can pick up some stuff from Dutch, but it's a mix of German and who That's knows what else. Same thing with Yiddish. That's what Yiddish is, is a mix of German and, and Hebrew. I can actually understand some Yiddish because I understand some German. Yeah. See? And that, that goes with the tribes mixing. They Not only did they mix, they mix their language. Um, Pidgin here in uh, Hawaii is a mixture of a lot of languages. Uh, phonics and, he, and, and I hear even some Hebrew um, you know, sounds in there, but also, um, you know, other things in, in this language they call pidgin. It's sort of like English, but it's also phonics, but it's also got like Hawaiian in it. So it's, it's, uh, 
it's a peculiar thing, but it's it's a legitimate language that people speak one another to one another. It sounds like a funny kind of Cajun. You ever heard Cajun speaking? Um, not in French, but in but in their you know Cajun kind of slang, Southern slang. So sort of like that. Hmm. But you know, uh, in Danish, for example, though it's a very small country, there's 500 islands and in the mainland, and there's different dialects in different areas. And I cannot understand a dialect from another area unless they speak the what we call the Queen's Danish. You know. Yeah. Even in England, you know, they have there's different like. Liverpool sounds different than those from Kent or Cambridge or, or whatever, right? So you can, you could, some people can just hear what you sound like and know where you're from in the, in the, the Isles, the, uh, Ireland and Scotland and Britain, just by what you sound like. Oh, you're from here. I can't do that, but you know, I can pick out like what someone from Liverpool sounds like, but it's only because of either the Beatles, but, there's different sounds that English it makes. It's not just one universal cross the board kind of language. But the interesting thing is, it seems that the codes all only convert to English. Well, I mean, we you get your head around that. The, but that's the Hebrew word that will have an English representation, even like the name of the Messiah. We, we're told that you know, it's Jesus and it goes through um, from Hebrew to, to Latin to, you know, Greek to English all the way down. It's some sort of altercation made when you can simply go from Hebrew to English and understand it's Joshua. There is no gymnastics involved. And you can see the same thing in a lot of Hebrew words um, that could even find a, a modern day equivalent for for instance, the word accountant um, in Hebrew. Let me let me pull this up. I mem chet shin bet. Mem chet shin bet is the four letters used in um, describing the job that Joseph had in Egypt, accounting the grave. Now that Hebrew word in ancient times for accountant or counting or computing is, this, is the same word yes. for the modern computer. It's an ancient yeah. word, but in modern times they use that same ancient word for computer and it's mem chet shin bet. And it, hey, it brother. Is, yeah. Sorry. Hey, while you got your tra while you got your translator open, I noticed something else that's that's kind of neat. the The translation that I was using for USA on that table, uh, Aleph, Resh, Hey, look where that comes up in the Tanakh. It comes up as the word "curse you" or "accursed." Mm. That's pretty interesting. Also, in the in the full counting, the full spelling of the letters, the the, the uh, sort of Brit that Gladerson talks about, it literally means the other covenant nation, which begs the question: Who's the first covenant nation? If there's one covenant nation, right, and there's another, who's the first one? But that's what a sort of Brit means: the other covenant nation. Um, I saw these direct parallels between the geographical nation of Israel and um, you know, North America, the, where supposedly Ephraim ended up. Anyway, has anybody got anything else they want to add before we, we close? I would tend to believe that Ephraim ended up in the United States because everybody wants to come to America. <laughs> well, I mean, if you think about it, when Ephraim is declared, he will be a fullness of, of nations. What do you have in America? America is a potpourri of many different nations and nationalities. It is literally the, the full, I mean, to, the verbatim of what Jacob said. It is the fullness of many nations. But also, when he crossed over his hands, is an indicator because he said the older brother would be 
um, the least of him, right? So the, the younger brother would be, excuse me, the older brother would be great, but the younger brother would be greater. He would become right. greater than the younger brother. And if you look at um, those two brothers in relation to the British uh -huh. Empire and the United States, that's exactly what happened. I mean, there used to be saying the sun never sets on the, the British or the, um, what do they call it? British. Um, the British Empire. The British Empire, right. The sun never sets on the British Empire, meaning that they had colonies all around the world and they were the, the superpower of the day. Well, in, con in you know, contrast to what we see now, with the 200 and something, 50 something years America has been a nation, has risen to you know, superpower status, even surpassing Britain. And that is no disrespect to, to my British brothers and sisters. I'm not trying to be arrogant. I'm just drawing a conclusion that I could see that in Ephraim and Manasseh, but also in the British and in the Americans, that though the British was great, America became greater. Um, you know, I, I see that fulfillment in there. Um, Darla sees it the other way around. Darla thinks that the United States is Manasseh and Great Britain is Ephraim, but it doesn't, that doesn't fit when it says the younger will be the greater and the older will be great, but not as great. I believe as you, um, Jonathan, because in what I can see, how the United States started, mm. it came out from England. So that would have been the older brother. Yes. Yep. And you can't be great before the older, like. It, it. Yeah. And we weren't, when we first started out, we were, we barely whoop them in the Revolutionary War, guys. And it was only because Britain was stretched out and so far all around the world. Had they concentrated their efforts in the colonies, they could have easily wiped out these rebels, right? But that's not what happened. And history records that, you know, King George actually gave in. It was like, okay, you have it. I've had enough of that trouble. And the rest was history. Um, we got help from the big brother. <laughs> yeah, we actually got help from others like France. France actually helped us at some point. We also got help from uh, others, um, the uh, mercenaries of the time. We, there, there were, um, our leaders were hiring other armies to come and help um, fight the British. Um, anyway, I see uh, and Manasseh now. Can I share with you a quick quote? Sure. Okay, okay. This is something I've been working on. Um, or oh, just one thing. Uh, I'll just uh, share it. Uh, do you see this? No. Yeah. Yes. You see it? Yes. Yes. Everybody? Yes, we I see agree. it. Yeah. Okay, okay. Okay. It's um. Oh, I, I have my well. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um. I was I was I was giving up on this table. Where I have to um. Do something here. Um. Um. This keyword, okay, this is from, I, I, I must say, this is from Google Translate also. So, it's, um, I hope it's correct. But the, um, the, the, the key, you, you see this, you see the arrow? Yeah. Yeah, you see that, yeah. Okay, the, um, the, this is pre-atomic. I was I was trying to get into the gap theory, and this is pre-atomic, I think. And um, uh, uh, um, okay, um, the. Um, the blue is is actually the howling. I was taking like Lucifer, yeah. 
the howling, I put the hay before the, like, uh, hay, 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 yot, lamet, lamet. I hope that's okay. Is that, Jonathan, is that, um, is that uh, legitimate, like a prefix or something? That would be phonics. I mean, you, you can phonically spell. That's how we spell America phonically um, with the with the Hebrew equivalent. So that that's perfectly fine to do that. Sometimes you, when you don't have a Hebrew word, that's when it applies to do that, is when you, you can phonically spell out. Um, oh, okay. I, I think this is Hallel. It is Hallel. Yeah, but I put a hey before, uh -huh. so it would come up. It's just four letters, so I put a hey, hey, yot, lamet, lamet. It's it's um, what what they call what they call Lucifer, but doesn't exist. Um, the yeah. um, <laughs> some believe that the Catholics actually did that. Uh, by the way, yeah, yeah, it's stupid. But um, then I got, what have I got here? Um, it's, um, yeah, and the, the uh, okay, I was going to give up on this table, but then I found, then I found, um, I found, pre-atomic, the howling, and actually, I, I was, I was, because I was trying to check in the, this is in, um, this is in Samuel, and it goes through the prophets, mm -hmm. Psalms, Job, Daniel, Chronicles, it's, uh, it's not in Genesis, but I, I put in pre-atomic and the um, the red here or, or this uh, purple red this is uh, this is what got me interested it says elders elders in like like older elders this this red here and the green no the the orange yeah this was this was what got me the orange orange is the orange is elder elders the the red is ancient and then I found in light green Abaddon. Yeah, you see it, Abaddon. Yeah, yeah I found Abaddon. And um, this this is like, I was showing you this, uh, I, I think that's all, but uh, uh, is this, this, I think it's, this is like in wrong color. Is this Abaddon? No, Abaddon is in the green. Um, is in the green this, this is... Uh, my, my notes, my yeah. notes are like uh, this is um, Ein Tav Yot Kuf or or no no um, how do you spell it? Yeah. So were you trying to say the time of the end? No, like before et is time. It would be time. This is pre-atomic, like before. Before like time, like between verses one and two in Genesis. Yeah. Like ancient, what was called? You're trying to say ancient times. Well, well uh, actually, I was showing you this book, the Silmarillion, because um, there is lots of legends on YouTube mm -hmm. about in in this. Uh, this uh, world J.R.R. Tolkien uh, was talking about that there are there are like Sauron there are before him came all kinds of of um, 
some kind of evil monsters or or gods for a lack of a better word and um these these ancients i would i would say if if there was ancients or elders um like um that there, there were some entities living in this between this gap mm-hmm. so i was just this got me interested and um but i have to i have to work more on it and uh it's just um I w- I was really I, I got really um when I found the where is the orange blue red uh yeah yeah the elders this this here I was I was quite I got uh, this I was giving up on this table then I found this one and I just what the elders like like something even even before like Apaton even before Lucifer fell or something it's it's like uh, well it's like just speculations but um I I really like would like to know more about this gap theory and what what happened because the earth became void and empty and I would like to know what caused it <laughs> mm-hmm. so that's that's all that's very ambitious I would think but I, I'm, I'm trying I, to find yeah, out things I, yeah I, I, I can see that but um, you make me think of what I see on Mud Fossil University M- Mud Fossil Mm. Okay. You heard of fossils. fossils. Yeah, what, I've been what? looking at that too. It's staggering. What, what's what's that in, in uh, there? This guy uh, Roger, who uh, who's got the Mud Fossils University, has yes. found that the a lot of the rocks uh, are around the planet are uh, ancient uh, living were living creatures. Uh, monstrous, huge. Yep. Okay. And, um, Have you ever heard of uh, the, pro- the process? Is that the silt when you when you're buried, a living thing is buried and compressed in wa- in water. The silt, which is minerals, seeps into the body. Okay. And and um, and that's what all the rocks are. Not all the rocks, sorry. A lot of some rocks are mineral rocks. But, um, He's got, he's had it uh, DNA tested. He's got the Smithsonian onto it, although I think he's made a mistake there. They'll squash it. Um, and uh, has a lot of information on his site about these ancient, yeah, these sorts of things. They, people are saying they're trees. They're not, they're tendons. Enoch, Enoch says those giants were 3,000 feet tall. They're little ones. Okay. That's what he's talking about. There's some, like they say, this is a, tr- this used to be a tree because there's other things like this in different <clears> places, <throat> but you know, but you can see it's, it's, it looks like some kind of organism, not stone. Um, yeah. yeah. Which is what happens when, when something um, is buried very quickly. Um, it can be petrified, not in millions of years, but <clears> in, you know, hundreds of years, things become petrified um, as, you know, some, recent uh, discoveries were made uh, after a volcanic eruption. <clears throat> Some trees were frozen in place vertically, and then uh, when they were excavated later, they found that they were had petrified. And so the, the understanding of how pe- something is petrified was completely um, rethought. But that's, that's what he's talking about is, you know, not just things like this, but there's also, you know, like, um, things that look like they could have been some sort of animal, like a dragon or are you yeah, I, oh, I dragonfly? You know, there's these different things that are clearly they are fossils of some sort, and uh, they're not a, some. In other words, that the argument is they're, they're a natural formation. Um, it happened yeah. naturally. Um, but yeah. But I I think I oh I, I yeah. am I 
Did I pull out? No, you were there. I was there uh, screaming and then I stopped. So. Yeah, there was something blocking my vision. But, but um, yeah, I, I would like to do um, like a code in Genesis, hopefully as near to one and two in Genesis, ch uh, chapter one, verse one and two. Oh. And I ho hope I find something. That there is there is huge lots of angels there. Yeah. Or messengers. <laughs> yeah, there is. I I personally believe the angels are stars. Uh, well, I think they're they are represented as uh, stars and planets. Um, yeah. And, and but but I actually I, I at this moment I believe the stars are angels. If you if you look at them in telescope, you see these vibrations. Mm -hmm. But that, that's just my ob observation now. It could change. I have to get more evidence. <laughs> my mom used to always tell me stars were angels, and I'd tell her, "Okay." I thought she was kidding until I read the book of Enoch, and I was like, "Wow, <laughs> okay." Yeah, I have to read that again. Uh, read it finish it but then you get all that it's not canonized <laughs> and it's like no but the book Enoch's a really good book <laughs> yeah. and they they refer to refer to it and the book of Yasser and more in in the Bible yeah yeah the book of wisdom was good too yeah that's cool that's really cool it fills fills in a lot of gaps in in places where um you know if you just read the scriptures you, you you're left going oh, oh. Man, what does that mean? <coughs> but in some cases, these other books fills in those gaps. And yeah. uh, after reading, like, you, like Jesser. Yeah, it makes sense now that what, what is said over here. Yeah. Kind of like when I read the, the book Bell and the Dragon and realized, well, hey, that's the story of Daniel. That belonged in Daniel. Yeah. How you doing, oh, uh, Sandy? How you doing? Shalom, Sandy. And, and Tony. Shalom, Tony. Shalom. How are you guys doing? Shalom. Oh, yeah, there is. I'm, yeah, I'm doing much better. I I, I um, listened to, I, I had a nap to the Book of Enoch, in fact. Um, um, that's why I overslept, I think. <laughs> um, I'm doing much better um, after taking care of my, my son. And okay. uh, I'm glad that I was able to get you guys. I apologize for being late, but um, blame it on Enoch. <laughs> <laughs> well, you get much of that out of that. I have have the code. Has um has anybody uh the you know put the codes um in the book of Enoch? The, the um, no, but the, um there isn't a program right now with Enoch. Um, there is over a hundred and thirty texts that have been tested uh, with the rabbi, so I know it is possible. That they can take a text and apply the the uh, appropriate mathematics to it to convert it. It's basically taking each individual letter, not out of sequence, and numbering it in a computer program. So it's has a position, and so when you when you type in a search term, um, based on that numbering system, uh, it can scan through all of those letters and find equal letter distant patterns. And so that's the premise of this. And so when it finds it, it'll put it on a cylinder. And you'll see it vertical so uh, it can be applied to literally any book it can be tested and see if these patterns exist so um, when we do get in the process of getting our, our program done um, that is one of the things we want to have included is, is uh, Enoch in there and it's probably yeah. Kasher and, and something else as well because um, it's tedious but but what I just explained to you is basically in a nutshell what it is. So a computer right. knows where those letters are in reference to what you're looking for, almost like a GPS coordinate. Right. And uh, uh -huh. it just takes and a the, lot it, of in chapters and verses. Yes, all of that has got to be entered into it uh, as it is, as the text is, and we would like to use um, the oldest example of a Hebrew text that we can find. On it. And I know that it does exist because I've heard rabbis teaching on Enoch. Uh, as 
they do observe Enoch as being a special Gentile. I mean, because this is written in the Torah. Uh, this, this Gentile had a special relationship with the Most High. And he writes, he's given a job, which is the, the, uh, the great scribe. He's given a task, and Yahuwah shows him everything from beginning to end, and he records all of this. Not only that, he also records everything that is said between heaven and these angels. Um, it, it seems to me that Enoch is, um, is a witness of some sort. And um, I think that's why he is taken, um, because he has a job in the end times, again. Uh, and incidentally, you can find in Enoch, the, the writings of Enoch, these angels wanted to kill him, and they couldn't because he was righteous before Yahuwah. They had to corrupt him first to kill him. Why would they want to kill him? Well, he's a witness against them, right? And so the, the two witnesses of the end times, that's where this plays a role and, and Enoch reappears in the end. Um, and I even think he's the, the one dress, the man dressed in linen with the inkhorn by his side that marks the, the elect. I personally believe that is Enoch that appears because it doesn't say an angel appeared and with an inkhorn, but it said, it says a man dressed in white linen with an inkhorn at his side. He has a special purpose and he's going around marking those are Ezekiel nine. Ezekiel nine. You mean? Yeah, Ezekiel. Six. Yeah. I wonder if you have you ever tried to search that out to see yeah. if uh, Anok is in there. Yeah, and it is. <laughs> he is in there. Yeah, it is. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that explains it. So this is a you know when I was looking for the two witnesses, all of this played in, and and so I was um, I could find Enoch in in these places where some he's not exactly mentioned. This is Enoch. It's just an, some ambiguous person, a man. He's not specified as an angel. He says it's a man. Yeah. Well, if you, you, you just kind of poke around a little bit. You can find that, um, well, there's other, there's other places that we know that Enoch is, he's got a special purpose where he's recording things. He's got, a, he's got an inkhorn and a writing utensil. He's also got books, um, scrolls or whatever. He's writing things down. And he's, you know, he's telling him to do things. And you see this guy appear in Ezekiel, and it's just specified it's a man dressed in all white linen with an inkhorn at his side, and he's marking in the supernatural, right? The angel is showing, showing Ezekiel people in that time did not see you know, Enoch going around marking people. Especially I've heard some pretty he was doing this in the spirit realm, right? So, yeah. But yeah, you, you – I've heard some pretty interesting theories about what that inkhorn could be. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's just a, it's a, it's a utensil that was used at the, um, you know, why didn't he have a ballpoint pen? I don't know. But <laughs> it's, it has its purpose where he's walking around marking people. And I don't think it's ink. It's some kind of heavenly marking because you don't see it. Only the, you know, angels and demons can see it. But you cannot, with these eyes, with, with flesh eyes, with spiritual no. eyes, you can see those kind of things. Yeah. You can see angels and demons. But right now, we're yeah. not allowed to see those because there's this veil uh, that we're... And incidentally, I think this is what the mystery of Yahuwah has re removed in Revelation at some point, where the angel declares this, that the mystery of Yahuwah is, is done. I think this is when the veil comes off everybody. Um, and incidentally... Yeah, the he had the inkhorn because every he was writing names in calligraphy. No, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. He's just marking. I think he's putting, he's putting the name of the Father on, on those people's foreheads. I mean, yeah. And Can I ask you about the veil? When yes. You mentioned the veil. Um, in relation to Yom Kippur, um, be uh, um. In learning the significance of the tearing of the veil on the, that one one day, do, do you? What do you, do you? I you know I mean I know I and you know many people learned much about the feast this year and the significance of, of the tearing of the veil I, I, this year I guess and it being just I mean the one day. Um, the Holy Spirit really opened my eyes, and 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 Yahuwah revealed much to my my 
I felt both good and and kind of scary. <laughs> but um, I mean, I know he's in control. Um, but um, I don't know. I'd like to know your thoughts on that. <laughs> it's about the, the ripping of the veil. Are you talking about in the temple yeah. when, when the veil was ripped? Yes. About, yes. And I, I mean, I, I got the significance between the um, um, the parallels between the ripping of the veil in the the temple on Caiaphas. Um, Caiaphas tore yeah. ripped his clothing <clears throat> in ancient uh -huh. times when the high priest did that, and the Bible. Uh -huh belief that Caiaphas did it out of uh, out of anger that he was angry at what at the response that Yeshua gave um, that he rent his clothes and I think it was when he said are you um, are you Elohim and, and he said I am he rent his garment but what happens when when high priest does that is he annuls and he gives up his priesthood he is done from that point on it's over it's like, um, you know, you're, you're, you're giving up the priesthood. So Christians just kind of blow over that and don't realize in, in, in the temple time, when this is done, the, 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 the priest is retired. He is done um, in the priesthood. Okay. Incidentally, this is what happened. Yahuwah did this to his Holy of Holies, essentially, mm -hmm. which was right. which didn't. This is where the high priest goes, essentially. And in right. ripping that veil, he was establishing that the, the job of that high priest was done. That you, Yeshua fulfills this. Now Yeshua is the high priest. Now Yeshua is the mediator that, that, that up until that point, man had to go to a priest for the gap that needed to be bridged between man and God or man and the Most High, right? Yeshua right. came and and tore that garment down the the, the uh, holy of holies, which is massive. It is over eighty feet tall and some forty oh, feet wide and about six inches thick. This is a huge piece oh. of cloth, and uh, he tore it from top to bottom. And that would have been a that to those Jews that saw that, and it's recorded in the Talmud that the. the uh -huh. Was torn that there was a huge earthquake that the doors were damaged the doors because of the earthquake the doors were ajar from that point on they did not stay plumb and and square one was ajar yeah. and therefore it stayed open every morning it was open the priest would have to close it because the door wouldn't stay shut anymore um uh -huh. it was supposed but, but, according to the talmud damage done during this major earthquake at the time of the crucifixion also is recorded there's there's a there's an astronomical event and and i don't think it's known astronomically as if it was um something that was um anticipated in other words like we we know when the eclipse is going to happen i think this eclipse happened out of nowhere and people were like what the right because it's been known for three yeah. hours right right yeah that's Hang recorded on. in the talmud so uh, no red flags goes off in anybody when they read that. They're just like, oh, oh, oh an eclipse happened. Oh, man, hey. kind of eclipse because a lunar eclipse is only seven minutes long. Okay. Right. So earthquake, right. temple is damaged, the veil is ripped. That clearly, based on uh, when we see the actions of some Romans, like the centurion was converted. Um, when, when he witnessed this, his eyes was healed. When the, when the blood and water hit him in the face, he could see again. He had cataracts. Uh, from uh, the morning that we read Josephus and other, other historical places we can find, even the Talmud, like I've just said, you can find puzzle pieces of the same story. For instance, what I just told you that day is recorded in the Talmud. Um, testimony from people that were there is recorded in some place. Nicodemus has a testimony he gives of the whole event as he saw it. It's not canonized. I think it's a legitimate book that needs to be read because he tells a piece of the puzzle, and it's it's an awesome what? testimony. If you ever read the testimony of Nicodemus, he has yeah. this com he has this conflict with Caiaphas, the high priest. Caiaphas obviously was not a stupid man. His he saw the same things happen. He saw the temple was damaged. He saw the veil was ripped. 
he saw the eclipse. He knows about this. Uh, they're going to say this body is going to be missing in three days. Even going to they, they got to, you know, we're going to make sure they seal this thing up, right? The resurrection happens. Caiaphas is buried with an ossuary which has three Roman nails in it. To me, that says Caiaphas came to a point where he believed we crucified our own Messiah. And an intelligent person would come to that conclusion. After seeing all of that evidence, you'd be just an idiot. I mean, think about that. You sacrificed someone who said he was the son of the Most High. And all of that happened. And you got a missing body at the end of the day, three days later. <laughs> Caiaphas is going around going, what did, what did we do? What did we do? Oh, my. He had a problem. And I know because you read it in Nicodemus, he has a conundrum. He's, in, he's investigating. He's going around going, what do you know about this? What is going on? Because there's testimony from, from reading that, that Caiaphas' own son, Samuel, was risen from the dead. And there was people talking about this. And Caiaphas wanted to know more. He was like, someone's seen my son. We, we crucify this guy. Three days he's in the grave, and then all of a sudden, all of these people are walking around, and that's not mentioned in the scriptures. But all of those that were in Abraham's bosom come out of the grave, guys. <clears throat> Where did they go? Wow. Where, what did they, did they just go around the world, and they, they went on to die a second death? Not at all. I think they got to go on to heaven because we are seeing there, there's the first fruits of the first the resurrection that are coming back with Yeshua in the second coming. Now, the church will tell you, oh, that's the resurrected saints in the rapture. No, it's not. It's the first fruits that went with him in the first resurrection. There's going to be a second resurrection, guys. Those that died from that point on till now come out of the grave at his coming, right? All that can be reconciled if you read the scriptures for what they are and then, you know, let it interpret itself without some theologian inserting something. And then if you have questions, reconcile that with the codes because it becomes very clear. Then we're talking about, man, <laughs> you know, the 24 elders that are seen, and you know, those guys came from somewhere previous of the church. Okay. There's the 12 sons of Joseph. And then there's the 12 disciples minus Judas and another Matthias added into that make up the 24 elders. <laughs> So, um, anyway, can, can now, I say can, so the, so the annulment of the temple is done in Yeshua when he fulfills the Passover? I mean, uh, the, the sacrificial law. Now he is our our king and our priest, right? He atones for us. That's that's you know part of the process on the on the mercy seat. Some believe this is why he says, "Don't touch me." I haven't sent it to the Father yet because the high priest could not be touched. Once he was cleansed and was ready to go before the Father in the um, Holy of Holies, he could not be touched by anybody, or he would be defiled, right? Some believe that's why Yeshua said, don't touch me, I haven't seen my Father yet. It was because he would come out of the grave, and now was the time he was going to take uh, the requirement before the throne room of, of heaven and make that atonement that is, uh, that is made there. There's also represented, represented in the earthly temple with the Ark of the Covenant was what the high priest was doing in the ark, uh, the, the, the horns of the altar and things like that is a representation of what is going on in heaven. Do you guys realize that? That yeah. the, the yeah. temple on earth was a representation of what is in, in heaven and, and as well as the mercy seat. This is a, a something that is constructed based on a design that already existed. Um, anyway, so when he rips this in his, um, his sacrifice, it is understood that um, that part of the system is, has been fulfilled. Uh, and so that's how I interpret that. Um, we, we are not in need of that priestly mediator anymore because now we have Yeshua and we have a direct connection to the Father now through Yeshua. And that's what he says. No man comes to the Father except through me. It doesn't mean that, you know, you only come to Yeshua and that's where the buck stops. No, 
he gave us access to the Father, guys. We, we have access to the Most High, not, to, not just to our Savior, but also to the Father of us all, right? And Yeshua came saying, Father, teaching us how to pray, our Father who art in heaven. He didn't say, this is how you're going to pray. You're going to say, Yeshua, my Savior, hallowed be thy name. He didn't say that, guys. He said, you're going to pray like this. We're going to say, our Father, in unison. It said, <laughs> our Father, our King. Yeshua was giving us demonstration that we are praying to the Father, right? He breached the gap. Yeah. That's why. He breached the gap for us. No longer did we need to go to a priest. Even in Catholicism, there is no need to go to a priest. You've got direct, straight line connection uh, to the Father. We got little kitty kitty. He's like, let me in. Can I, can I say one, one thing? Yes. Uh, about the veil, hmm? um, it says like uh, when, when the Jews or the unbelievers uh, hear the Torah or the Tanakh, their, their, their minds are veiled, but in, in Yeshua or Yehoshua, the, the veil is done away. Yes. So Hallelujah. we... Like, I think it's meaning also that we see Yeshua in all of the Old Testament. Yeah. Yeah, even, even some believe that Mechizedek is, actually is Yeshua. I think so. Some actually interpret that. That's actually Yeshua himself, uh, this, this high priest that Abraham goes to and offers, and offers an offering to. He, uh, he had no, 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 no beginning or end of days. Yeah, he so. was eternal. So I, I would encourage, read Enoch, absolutely. Or if you don't read it, listen to uh, Robert's uh, recording. It's Apocrypha 1970 on YouTube, and he's got a audio version of it. And you could just put it on in the background and just, you know, listen. Uh, I've done that several times and uh, always picking up something in there that I missed before. Um, and like he's I said, got the perfect voice for it, too. He does. He has a really good narrator's <laughs> voice. And, yeah. You know, and who, usually, who is that? This is Apocrypha 1970. Uh, his name is Robert Farrell. Okay. And uh, he has, he does, he does all kinds. He does Jasher. He does all of those um, books. And uh, he was actually an atheist, guys. Um, he walked into wow. a store one day and, he, and the first thing that he ever read, didn't read the Bible, he read Enoch. And he saw a lot of science explanation in there. Seriously, yeah. his testimony. Uh, so he was an atheist. Enoch brought him into the knowledge of uh, the Most High, and then he read the Bible, and he, he started going to church, and he even met his wife in church, and, you know, he has a ministry and stuff. So um, formerly an atheist, wow. and Enoch brought him to the, to the belief in the Creator. How's that? <laughs> yeah. Wow. He actually saw in that story, and he, he understands it. it. He tells in his testimony as an as a, uh, ancient record. And he saw a lot of science and astronomy and things like that in there. Um, that is, and, and as an ancient writing, all of this was known. And for instance, how what the shape of the earth is and all that kind of stuff is all in Enoch. Right. So you didn't need the, you know, people to That's circumvent the earth or whatever to determine what is already was in the Bible and in, in ancient writings. Incidentally, the Muslims will tell you that it was the Quran that reveals this truth, but it, it was not. The Quran is only 1,400 years old. Um, mm. So, yeah. Is there anything <laughs> yeah. else you guys want to add? And did I answer your question, yeah. Tony? Um, yeah, my goodness. I, I hope you're recording that because that was uh, the most amazing answer ever. I could <laughs> I even think of. Thank you so much for sharing all that. I. I Imagine quite speechless from all the revelations that brought. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm going to have to read Nicodemus. Um, yes, yes. That, you can find. Uh, I think yeah. Robert also does Nicodemus. So, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I think you, what you'll see in that, and I promise you, you will find puzzle pieces in these books that make the 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 Bible make sense in somewhere, some form where you were thinking, what does that mean? Some, you know. Right. You'll see that in many cases. I promise. Oh, it's exciting. Very exciting. Thank you. All right. So we got the coat coming up. 
on us really quick. I'm picking up my oldest son, Keaton, tomorrow from the uh, airport, and then we are getting down to business with Sukkot. Um, okay. I'll be sharing with you the experience. Hope, Terrence, that you that you you know um, watch if you want to learn what that's about. Is basically just spending time with your family, camping outside under the stars. We're supposed to observe the stars um, again. This practice, what's he having his practice for at Sukkot time in the end times looking at the stars? Hmm. I don't know. What, why are we looking at the stars? I think we're supposed to see something in the end times in, in the stars. And that's why I pay a lot of attention uh, to the stars. I know he's telling us something in that, that we're supposed to see something. Uh, you know, he does things in the Maseroth, comets, all kinds of anomalies where he's, he's telling us something. Uh, and, and there are those that have the eyes to, to see and understand. And uh, so I would, if, if you have time, Terrence, you, you're not busy. Uh, well, I think we're going to do a couple of live streams, maybe um, different times. I'll let you guys know over in hip chat or um, wherever in uh, we'll have some teachings involved in, in it. All right. Yeah. yeah. C can you, can you have teachings? Like if there's something important like a dietary or um, something, uh, could you, do like a piece before. Is okay. that possible? I think so, yeah. To, to instruct how, th how to, sure. to do this. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. When exactly is Sukkot? What days do you know? Um, well, I got to get out my calendar. Um, but you'll keep in touch through hip chat, yeah? Yes. Yeah. I, um, we'll have hip chat um, open. I got to go to Troy's site, which is uh, that creation calendar. I think it's tomorrow. We start tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Tomorrow. I could be wrong. And Darla's not here. She's usually one that, that lets me know what day it is. <laughs> <laughs> here, yeah, I often get her too. <laughs> All right, guys. I'm going to uh, stop the class here. I'm going two hours. Uh, I'll get this uploaded. Um, I did get it recorded, so that's good. Um, uh, we'll, we'll, like I said, we'll do a broadcast and uh, be looking for that for a live stream. All right. Abba, here we are, Father. We are thankful for this fellowship, for this class. And Lord, I just ask that you bless them, that you keep them nurtured, Father, and if they're, if they're sick in some way, that you would heal their body, that you would make them whole again. Go with them this week, Father. Keep them safe. Bring them back to us in the next class. We ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. All right. Amen. 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 Shalom. 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 Shalom.